2023's Mission Impossible 7 Part 1, also known as Dead Reckoning, review and thoughts, and yeah, so I realized, uh, let's, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved, and I think you will too, this is, you know, I've seen someone say, this is the reason we go to movies, and yeah, absolutely, if at all you care about, like, seeing something cool, watch this and watch it on the biggest screen you can at all. Right, so yeah, the video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious topics. I realize this video is long, I'm going to can to make it worth your time. Uh, yeah, I start with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose the lower index finger. Uh, I, I will not be warning before spoilers for th the first six movies. And as soon as in the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. Now, the movie is rated PG-13, and they don't push it as hard as, like, say, Guardians of the Galaxy 3. They do push it a little further than we've... than we used to see, but... Yeah, and it does a good job, like, it doesn't feel like they're, like, being prevented from going as violent as they would like, you know, the way that, you know, parts of The Dark Knight Rises kind of do. And, it's, you know, considering how many people are shot in that movie, there is a wild lack of, of blood when people are shot. And, let's see, right, and, and, yeah, I will not be swearing in this video. And, yeah, so I, I watched this movie once in theater, I just got back from theater, and then I hit record. And, uh, right, that, bring, that brings us to the, the plot. So, uh, yeah, IMDb... Ethan Hunt and his IMF team must track down a dangerous weapon before it falls into the wrong hands. And... Yeah, so this is one of those movies, you know, I've been following this franchise. I, di I didn't watch the first movie in 1996. I probably watched around 98 or 9 or something. I've been following these movies ever since. I've been watching from, from the fourth one on. I've seen them all in the theater. So, yeah, um, you know, when, if, if this movie had looked terrible, I almost definitely would still have gone to see it in theaters just, you know, for the, yeah, you know, at this point, it's such a, you know, yeah, there, there are movies that I've gone to see in theaters, even though I didn't expect them to be good, uh, you know, so yeah, but yeah. Trailers looked amazing, and the movie absolutely delivers. And yeah, this is one of those movies where the like the technical aspects are very, very impressive. Incredibly talented, skilled, and enthusiastic people working on this. Now let's start with the writing. So this was written by. Eric Gendrison and director Christopher McQuarrie and I'm not really familiar with the other work let's see Eric Gendrison he also wrote part two other than that I don't know any of this Killing Lincoln that was him wow dude must be very old by now, but Christopher McQuarrie, as you know, before he started directing action movies, he was already doing a fantastic job writing. You know the the yeah, he's he's he wrote the Usual Suspects, which you know, if you watch it today, you know. It sucks that we were asked to empathize with Kevin Spacey, who we by now know is a really disgusting person. 
and it also just it doesn't hold up quite as well. Like everybody remembers the ending, you know the the that's the but anyway, the writing is actually good. It's mostly the direction that's very like a lot of the time it's just okay. So this is let's just kind of I don't I don't think that Brian Singer, who we also now know is disgusting. I don't think it's that he was trying to put in the bare minimum effort. He just didn't really know what he was doing completely with that one. Anyway, the writing is really, really strong. And, right, he wrote for... He, he wrote Valkyrie. So, you know, he and, he and Tom Cruise have been working together for quite some time. And the, the first Jack Reacher movie... He both wrote and directed Cruise, and he wrote Edge of Tomorrow, which, you know, not the biggest fan myself, but it's definitely well written. It wrote and directed Rogue Nation, Fallout, and this. He did also, he took part in writing The, the Mummy, but... He wasn't the only person, and considering that Alex Kurtzman is credited with writing the screen story, I think, gotta say, based on the other stuff Kurtzman has written that I'm familiar with, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's more a Kurtzman thing than that Macquarie did bad there. Anyway, what? Oh, right, and he also wrote Top Gun Maverick. Uh, wait. It's said, but now it's saying no. Yeah, yeah, he did. He was one of the the screenplay writers for that. So, so yeah. Christopher Macquarie, incredible writer, and he and Tom Cruise have a great working relationship together. So, it's really no wonder that he got brought in for you know the the fact that they've been making these together for several you know ag again since the the um since the fifth one did i say that wrong before i'm yeah you know 5 6 and now 7 so yeah um yeah the the writing is really really good here like i there's a little bit of Tell Don't Show going on, which is unfortunate, but at the other... Part of it is that a big theme in this movie is, can you believe what... You know, not, not in, like, a, you know, surreal or, or like, mind-altering kind of way, but if something is digital... Is it trustworthy? Is is something? It it it's a big theme in this movie. So the fact that it's people with their words to their faces, to making eye contact, that's significant. But it doesn't make it that much more compelling. You know, it it's it's not wonderful to have in a movie that's this long. But yeah, um, every every character feels distinct. The, the different scenarios are very creative. They, they really come up with some cool, like, you know, it's, it's getting in, intensely difficult. I, I'm, I'm really glad it's not my job to top. Because you it's, it's not enough to just do better than the last movie in your own franchise. You have to outdo other franchises as well. So you basically, it's, just, it's, it's amazing that they managed to, to do yeah, to top it. The movie handles plot twists quite well. And yeah, that brings us to the direction, which is again Christopher McQuarrie. And yeah, the um, right, so my my ranking of the Mission Impossible movies, and these are worst to best, keeping in mind I love all of them. So, yeah, the bottom is the second one, and it really is just because it's aged poorly. I can still sit down and really love watching it. The, yeah. The next one in the ranking is Mission Impossible 3. 
Obviously, I'm grateful that it breathed new life into this otherwise dying franchise, but I do find it frustrating with the unanswered questions, such a heavy focus on Ethan and Julia, when even at the time, it was kind of obvious Julia's not going to be a major part of the following movies. Like, what are they going to do? Make her a spy? Have him call her every so often? Like, I don't think it's ever made sense to pretend that Ethan is going to end up with a specific love interest and and just as like you know if she isn't in some way already involved in this world you know that's one area where the second is at least slightly better you know overall i do prefer the way movies four through six handle the idea of him ending up with a major female character next in my rankings is the the fourth movie i think it's a mistake that the you know, I think it was a bad idea writing wise that the the good guys fail so many times over the course of the movie with no real consequences. I mean, yeah, they get disavowed, but that happens in every movie other than the second one. And yeah, now we're near the the very top picks. The first movie, almost everything about this holds up incredibly well. The only reason, that it's not the number one pick is how defined the franchise has been from the second onwards by not only heists, which this has great scenes of, but also by action scenes. And the first one does not really, you know, I don't think it's a problem for it, but when you start watching as a franchise, you know, it's not, yeah. And right, the, the fifth one, is my, my next pick pretty much perfect no wonder Ilsa has been in both of the movies since this one and right at the end of the review I will update this ranking with this movie but yeah for now the sixth one is the top pick you know the the it's the first true sequel not just new chapter let's see yeah, it's the first that really explores Ethan Hunt's character, and yeah, you know, there's just everything about the sixth movie works. You know, the the yeah, the stunts, the characters, the the double crossing, like everything, just yeah. Now, yeah, so so you know. This movie, the seventh one, being by the same writer and director, I was wondering if this one would also explore Hunt's character. It does somewhat... Yeah, it probably, it probably does to about the same extent overall. And, yeah, they, you know, does a, does a really great job. It's, it is kind of wild that it's taken them this long to get like personal for the for the lead spy when that's like I mean I you know the the Bourne movies right from the onset were very much about that I suppose James Bond wasn't like taking over the movies by his personal but we knew his person his personality came through very very distinctly and his his history from the very first movie, Doctor No. So yeah, it actually it's I I I would actually I would be fascinated to find out why they didn't do that with with this one with this franchise. I mean, anyway, let's see. And yeah, you know, yeah, before the the sixth movie, it was basically like. New movie, new chapter, doesn't matter that much if you remember the earlier movies, other than who's on whose side. But yeah, Macquarie has been directing these, let's see, yeah, since the fifth one. With the next one, he'll have done four. No other director has made more than one. So that really tells you how, just, yeah. And I, I wouldn't have it any other way. So, yeah, when you think of Tom Cruise, other than the horrible Scientology stuff, you think of his movies will have him actually carrying out incredible stunts. He will deliver a charismatic, winning performance. 
even if it may not necessarily be one where he challenges himself, and his movies are almost always worth watching in theaters. And yeah, this absolutely delivers on all three of those fronts. And let's see. I think I'm gonna. Um, there we go. So the um, right, I, you know, Palm Clementiev is French. So while she's most familiar to me personally as the very tender, sweet, and frequently non-threatening mantis from the MCU, she does have this mystique to her. Like, you know, you, you look at her, you're not sure exactly what she's thinking. She could be hiding, really, you know. So I was thinking that's what they were going to do with her, but no. Instead, they do something that I thought was much, much better. She's basically this, like, she's not the only one. There's, there's... Yeah, it's not a, a spoiler to say. She and Gabriel, played by S.I. Morales, are both these very sadistic, like, it's not it's not breaking new ground in that regard. You know, we've seen that before, but, I mean, if it ain't Baroque, just, whenever you look at the, the you know, especially, like, Palm Clementiev plays a character named Paris. Whenever she's like in an action scene, if she is hurting someone, she's like, yes, like her eye, her 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 face just beams with joy. And if she's trying to hurt someone and they manage to, to you know, and it doesn't end up happening, she's like, oh, you know, just like, just so so frustrated. I was really hoping to, to hurt that person, you know, and just, yeah, you, we really, we, we just, we want to see them stopped, and it just, it works incredibly well, and I'm, I'm really glad they're back, but I can't help but notice where the first four movies each had a new conventionally attractive woman, both the fifth and the sixth one introduced one that returned at least once since, I mean, they're great characters, great actors, I'm not complaining, but, you know, yeah, as the the um, yeah, those two are back, and now there is also a new, you know, conventionally attractive woman. That yeah, it just the the you know clearly they were determined to bring back the ones we already met, and and again, one hundred percent ours. Like I don't, I don't. I did, I, there's literally no one. Like, if, if, if you say so, I will not believe you that you watched the fifth movie and was like, I really don't want to see more Elsa Faust. Or you watched the sixth movie and you were like, White Widow, whatever, just no more, please. Just no, we all wanted more. I I completely understand why they and and they like they came up with you know it is you can you can kind of tell it's like they started from the the yeah they they you know McQuarrie sat down to write and he was like okay I gotta bring those two characters back so he thought of ways to get them involved in the spy plot you know. You know, there is evidently a law that says every spy movie that doesn't have Jason Bourne's name in it, if it is a sequel, has to introduce at least one new conventionally attractive woman. I absolutely do not love the fact that this manages to fit in, you know, several conventionally attractive women. All of them are white. Like, the second and fourth movies in the series do have women of color in those roles. Two out of seven, that's enough abysmal record. Like, you cannot tell me that you are unable to find conventionally attractive women of color working in Hollywood today. Like, if you want, black ones just, you know, the two Black Panther movies alone both feature five. Like, it's just, there's, there's, 
it's it's it bugs me. And let's see. Right, always love seeing Haley Atwell playing spies and characters working with them. This MCU, and the, yeah, here you know she's playing this character that you don't completely know she's like the the cat woman or you know that kind of thing like you don't completely know if you can trust her or not you know the that kind of thing uh, you know as as always adds some some spice to these movies right i wanted to add i would definitely say there's at least a couple too many characters in this i would say maybe two yeah two two characters too many and it's just, you know, we end up, like, there's several characters that we don't really get to know, despite how much, you know, they're, they're important to the movie, but they could have been combined with other characters. Now, the, the first Mission Impossible movie is actually the only time in the entire movie series where the team is equally women and men instead of almost only men and even so it's only at the very start of the movie and the second movie is the only one where the writing is not incredibly strong and yeah writing is very strong in this one uh, yeah the first six all start well and the climax is even better than that and this uh, yeah yet again does yeah, the first movie makes great use of Prague, as we see Ethan with the people of Prague. Prakidians, Proglodytes, Proctologists, that's it. And... Yeah, so the, the trailers promise action aboard, you know, moving vehicle. I'm on the record as saying that I think pretty much every action movie is made better by at least... Like, today, I get, you know, I'm not like... When I sit down to watch one from like the 70s or 80s, I'm not like, wait, just do it with CG or what, you know, no. But today, you know, unless your action movie is very low budget, just, yeah, it's it's really, really cool to have at least one action scene on a moving vehicle, train, plane, prisoner transport, just, you know, almost always that scene is a real standout. And, yeah, um... I I wasn't hugely bothered that this was only part one. You know, it, it's kind of like with Infinity War and Spider-Verse 2. It just makes us passionate about seeing the next one, you know, rather than Justice League, whether we're talking about the theatrical cut or the Snyder cut. just makes us really relieved that the part two is not coming anytime soon. Now, I... Yes, a, a quick... There's a... Um, so yeah, the following, you know a lot of what I'm about to say, but it's still really nice to see, and I love to say it. So, yes, where we, you know, we have so many action movies today where, like, characters will do things that, like, you as the audience are like, that's not real, that's definitely some sort of effect, you know. In this, like, you know, it's stuff that we're like, can they really do that? But, like, clearly a lot of it is real, like, just, you know they're they're hiding the the safety precautions they took, but those are real stunts, you know. And yeah, the 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 action scenes tend to be driven uh, driven by and focused on stunts, not like CG or or those kinds of things. And yeah, you know we see them do amazing things, but it's stuff that it, it's amazing because. It's like how did they how did they do that safely? How how did the stunt stuff work out? Like you know, it's not the kind of thing where we're like, oh wow, you know that character can fly or something. You know, I love those movies, most of them, but not. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm really really glad that we're that that Cruz is so dedicated to to the stunt. You know, once again, not a big fan of him as a person. Um, you know, really really reprehensible the way he treated his wives and yeah you know the whole the the um hold on it's the the um, I know I have it 
Scientology, you know, that whole thing, just, uh, yeah. And, yeah, you know, the, the filming and editing is not trying to hide that it's actually stunt people and there's effects, you know, sh you know, the, yeah, they're taking shortcuts to hide that they didn't do something for real. Not the case at all. Like, the, the, the filming and editing, in fact, really underlines how much of it is real. Now, let's see. Yeah, so some, some critic quotes. Um, right, well, yeah, one guy says Rebecca Ferguson does some of her best work here. That's very true. And... Yeah, and, and, you know, one one user who said, I kept noticing that a lot of scenes had just two or three people in them, and I kept imagining the cruel mask up, as well as the cast when the camera wasn't on them. It can be easy to, it can't be easy to make a huge movie like this during a pandemic, but it definitely shows, and that is very true. And, right, one, one person said, it feels a bit more classic in tone with a lot of the themes and plot developments resembling the first movie, the Mission Impossible movie, I really enjoyed that. There's more intrigue and mystery than outright action. Very true. And I would add, it even has the two part of a whole MacGuffin element. Now, let's see. Yeah, one, one person says too much storytelling in the movie, almost making sure that you could understand every little moment. And, yeah, that, I, I do think there is some to that. And this person also says it was increasingly frustrating and annoying, the comic, the comedy stuff. And, yeah, I, I don't know what happened. I mean, it kind of felt kind of MCU and... You know, I love the MCU, I swear by those movies, but I did, not everything needs to be MCU, you know. So, yeah, it did kind of feel like, because the MCU definitely uses humor as a way to just avoid, like, you know, it's, being funny isn't easy, but it can be easier to, you know, choose to put some comedy in rather than play something completely straight. Because if you play it straight, you risk some people not going with it and, you know, your movie might not work. If you put in a joke, you know, there's going to be people, myself included, saying, you didn't need a joke there. But for a bunch of people that might have been like, okay, this is getting to be too much. You know, let's let's ease off here. You know, they got what they, you know, yeah. And let's see. Right, one person says it takes a while to get going, but then it's great. Absolutely agreed. Really well put. Uh, some people felt there's too much focus on the key changing owner, and there's too much pickpocketing. I don't know. I, I thought it worked, but yeah, to, to each their own. And right, one, one person, um, let's see, stroppy, oddly vacant, disjointed plotline patched together with noticeable manipulation around actor availability and crew safety. And yeah, there's definitely some. And... Yeah, that brings us to... So yeah, the opening does a really great job set, you know, yeah, just, just giving us an idea of what we're in store for. I really don't want to give anything away. I'll just, I'll just say it's a really, really great scene. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but... The ending fits with what came before. I'm happy with how the movie ends. And the movie does not have a post credit scene, at least according to Google. Um, you know, 
because I saw that on Google, I left before seeing because I don't I don't think Google has ever steered me wrong when it comes to that question. Now, uh, let's see. So yeah, that brings us to characters. So yeah, Tom Cruise as Ethan Hunt, uh, IMF agent, leader of a team of operatives, and yeah, uh, we we learn a little bit about him that we didn't know before which I quite appreciated adding some some depth to the character and yeah just like he has a compelling conflict in this you know again really appreciate I'm really glad that these I'm guessing the next one also will but certainly now it's two movies in a row I, I really appreciate that and let's see so oh, right, I'm I'm not saying that there wasn't anything that he cared about in the other movies, just that it wasn't really like it wasn't really exploration as as such. And Ving Rames plays Luther Stickel, and IMF computer technician, member of Hunt's team, and his closest friend, and the two have some great exchanges. You know, the fact that because yeah, like. Legit, they're the only two people who have been in all seven of these movies. You know, literally no one else has been in all of them. Even though, you know, Luther, he's only very briefly in the fourth one. But other than that, he's he's a really, he's a major character in, in all seven. And, yeah, I, it's, you know, I really appreciate that they gave, you know, they didn't, like, say, oh, you know, but, like, Ving Rhames, he's not super young, he's not, like, the teens aren't as in love with him as, you know, you could easily see how, like, a lesser writer would have given this to to some new, you know, some some fresh, fresh like, I could 100% I could imagine someone writing the Vanessa Kirby character to do that, and to be clear, I'm not saying anything negative about Vanessa Kirby. She's awesome. I really love her in both of these. It's just that they don't have that kind of relationship, but Ethan and Luther do, and the fact that it's... The, yeah, really, really appreciate... You know, sometimes just who's saying something to a character and when can make a huge difference, and it does here. I really appreciate it. Like, just... Gah, I... I I love seeing movies written by people by, by writers who know you know honestly a lot of writers probably would be able to if not for studios getting in their way and I'm really I'm hoping for the best outcome for the the writer strike you know I I really the the let's see the the fact that it even Right, and and you know now that there's also the 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 actors striking, you know this is hopefully gonna. I'm, I'm yeah, I can absolutely imagine that this is going to really change things. And just like when you look at the the um when you look at the the issues that the writers want dealt with. You know, clearly they are in the right. Now, uh, right, and Simon Pegg plays Benji Dunn, and I'm a technical field agent, a member of Hunt's team. He's been with these since the third movie, so he is also, you know, he's been here for a long time. And, yeah, I, I thought they, you know, I've always been happy with how they used his character. I think that this might be my favorite use uh, of of him in in any of these movies, uh, you know, I I really appreciate it, and I also kind of like like I get it. Simon Pegg is is funny. We, this is this is something we all know. Like part of the reason he got cast in Mission Impossible Three was because every like all over the world we all loved Sean Sean of the Dead, you know, from from two thousand four, two years prior the release of Mission Impossible 3, so I get why he has often been, like, the sort of comic relief, you know, and, and just also, you know, that movie was directed by J.J. Abrams, so, 
Benji in that one is a sort of, you know, hand-me-down... Oh my god, I cannot believe I'm blanking on that character's name. I'll, I'll have it momentarily, I swear. Um... Marshall. Hand me down Marshall Flinkman. I, I do really appreciate that here they they somewhat tone that down. You know, it is maybe also, I feel like, like his voice is a tad more tired and, and grizzled now than it was, you know, earlier in, in, in his career. So him, like, Shouting a line is not going to be quite as funny, but but yeah, just I, re I really appreciate that there is there's another element here that just yeah. Rebecca Ferguson returns as Ilsa Faust. I I think I've said it before, but I, I it bears repeating. I really really admire. I I don't know if he came up with it, but Crystal McQuarrie did write the the screenplay for the the fifth movie uh, you know mission impossible let's see rogue nation that's it he wrote the screenplay for rogue nation oh but not entirely no yeah yeah he wrote the screenplay by himself drew pierce helped write the story but yeah um i i really admire coming up with naming a spy, Ilsa Faust, and then actually running with it. Like, I, I, how do you look a producer in the eye and say, no, I am serious. I, it, it's not, it's not supposed to be a joke. That's her actual name, you know, and then, then like casting and, and people are like, okay, fine, whatever. I guess, I, you know, this is obviously not a very serious thing, but I guess I can do, you know, and then like, directing someone and and you know Rebecca Ferguson has had to respond to the name Ilsa and and Miss Faust for for three movies like I just uh, it's 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 masterclass trolling and I I'm, I'm here for it and yeah she does a fantastic performance just absolutely love to to see just you know it there's just you know, um, I feel both qualified to and, uh, you know, allowed to comment on this since I'm Danish. She's Swedish. There is a, you know, here in Scandinavia, we can, some sometimes we're a little, not like quite like British, oh, you know, oh dear, kind of, you know, chilly but just just slightly like not not like over the moon just completely you know and and that works really well for spy fiction you know it's obviously but yeah i'm really really glad the the she just, just does such a fantastic job vanessa kirby plays alana mitsopolis black arm black market arms dealer also known as the White Widow, daughter of Max from the first film, and yeah, like just absolutely love seeing her again. Just f fantastic that that yeah, and and she continues to do a, a phenomenal impersonation with, without it feeling like really disrespectful, which obviously it could. I'm just gonna make sure I get the name right before I say, but yeah, yeah. Max in the first movie was played by Vanessa Redgrave. Now, you know, you can understand why it's not still her playing, the, you know, the role in in the more recent ones. But yeah, you know, she. I don't. I don't need to tell you that Vanessa Redgrave is amazing. This is this is common knowledge. Uh, you know, it's it's. So it, it's some baby's first words, uh, you know. It's, some say mommy, some say daddy, some say, boy, Vanessa Redgrave can act. Like, holy crap. 
but to find a good balance of like imitation but not like making fun of her because that would just feel like what are you what are you doing this is not you know but yeah um Vanessa Kirby masterfully straddles that line i'm i'm very very impressed that that she can do such yeah and and her also there's something really compelling about here Haley Atwell plays Grace. Crystal McQuarrie described her character as a destructive force of nature. Atwell explained her character's loyalties are somewhat ambiguous. And she's got this great, like, there's this sort of coy, like, coquettish, yeah, like, the, the you know, she knows that, like, Considering what she can do, you could understand if the character was just this, like, very business, you know, all, all business, very focused kind of type. But no, she actually, she seems to, to take some enjoy, some, yeah, take some enjoyment out of what she does. Shay Wiggum plays Jasper Briggs. Really loved seeing him, like, the, the... I'm not sure what I even, like, what I even really know him from, but just, yeah, he's, he's, oh, I guess it's probably Joker. Yeah, he's really great there as, as well. Yeah, that's, Silver Linings Playbook. Yeah, I guess I, I kind of vaguely recall, but but yeah, just, you know, he's he's fantastic, and there's this great thing where, like, basically his character is, <laughs> he was, he played an agent in the 2002 Bad Company, which, you know, one of the major roles in that was played by Anthony Hopkins, who was, uh, you know, an important part of the Mission Impossible organization in the second movie. So there's a bit of a connection there. Anyway, basically, Shay, you know, J Jasper, he's trying to stop Ethan. And, yeah, it's it's this, like, basically, for for several of the major you know, set pieces in this movie. You have Ethan and his team, Gabriel and his team, and then you have Jasper, you know, and or his, his people. Certainly, you know, the force led by him. And it's just... It, it makes the writing so much more complicated. It You know, he, he really gave himself a much diff, much tougher job here but it also makes the movie so much more compelling because legit, like, you know, it, it, at this point, like, we've seen Ethan, you know, run circles around his opponents. So, like, you got you got to up the ante. It's it's kind of like how the the you know Prison Break season four versus season five. It's like you gotta go, you gotta take it up a notch. Otherwise, it's just like mm, we've seen it before, kind of thing. We have not seen this before, and and yeah, it's just it's such a great that little element that not only do Ethan and his team have to contend with Gabriel and his team, you know, they but also actually worry about getting caught by by Jasper and yeah. And Henry Cerny plays Eugene Kittredge, the former director of IMF. Last seen in the first movie. I'm really glad they brought him back. Like, honestly, just put him in everything. He was freaking amazing in Ready or Not. And, yeah, he's he's so good here. Like, it's just, love seeing it. Just so, yeah. And yeah, there's a, there's more to his character than I thought there was gonna be, and his character is very different 
than what I thought it was going to be. Frederick Schmidt uh, uh, plays Zola Mitsopoulos, Alana's brother. I'm almost 100% certain that he was also in the sixth movie. So, yeah, it's still great to see him again. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily have hated if, like, his character had been combined with someone else. I, I don't know that that was really... But but it's also like he's just he's he's cool. Like you see him on screen, it's like, yes, that guy again. You know. And I think that is gonna be it for that. So yeah, the let's see, I've already talked about the yeah, I get. I I talked a little about the the cinematography, but to get more into, you know, they 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 do a number of shots that's slightly at a distance to like really underline. No, there's no like there's no safety really really close by. At least like super obvious kind of thing, you know. And Yeah, the, the cinematography was handled by Fraser Taggart. And Fraser has... Oh, that's right. Uh, five cinematography credits. Holy crap, this did not feel like... This is only the third movie he's, he's done. Other than that, he did two shorts. This... Wow, this did not at all feel like, oh, you know, just let's bring in some guy that, uh, and I've never even heard of, yeah, he DP'd Dead Fish and Robot Overlords. I've literally never, even, I've heard of some of the people who worked, who also, who, some of the other people worked on those, but anyway, um, but yeah, before that he was, um, he worked in camera and electrical department. You know, he has 47 credits there, and he was the second unit director on Maleficent. But, but yeah, fantastic work. Just really, like... Yeah, there's this, there's this party, you see some of it in the, in the trailers, and just the way that he actually, he manages to capture the, the scope and the light. Just, yeah, amazing stuff. The editing was handled by Eddie Hamilton, who, yeah, he, he has 48 edit, you know, credits as editor total. Some of them are, like, shorts, and he edited DOA, Dead or Alive, the, the 2006, yeah, that's an X-Men first class, yeah, very, very talented editor. And he's also been editing, he, he also edited Mission Impossible 5 and 6 and Top Gun Maverick. There's a, there's a Minotaur movie? Okay, I kind of got to check that out at some point. With very young... Tom Hardy. Anyway, yeah, the the DOA like that movie is not like good, but it's so much more fun than it has like it's better than it has any right to be. It's so it's it's a legitimately fun movie. Like just yeah. Anyway, the um, that brings us to Right, yeah, so the the budget Yeah, um two hundred and ninety million. Some of that is because of, of COVID. But yeah, um a huge chunk of that. Right up on uh, right there up on the screen. Like just it looks ridiculously expensive as it is and yeah they get a lot out of the actual 
location shooting. You know, they filmed some in Norway, Rome, Abu Dhabi, let's see, uh, a couple parts of England, and Venice. So just, yeah, really, really, that's, that's another thing, like, you know, if you're tired of too many blue screen sets, this movie, no blue screen sets. This is all actually real. And... Yeah, so the, the action scenes, there's a great variety also. You know, the, the... Yeah, you know, chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, there's shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. Just, yeah. You know, they, they find some, some cool vehicles and have them chase each other, you know, smack into stuff really, really hard. Like, on more than one occasion, a character looks at another character that was in the same car and is like, are you okay? And, and it's, you know, and we're sitting there in the audience like, no, seriously, are, are you okay? Like, do, do we need to cut the camera? The person might have a concussion or something that looked really serious, you know, and just... Yeah, um, there's this one bit where, like, a vehicle, like, goes rolling and just, yeah, um, let's see, there's some, yeah, there's some great up-close fights, sometimes involving, you know, switchblade, yeah, just, yeah, really, really cool stuff, and that brings us to the music which is handled by Lorne Bolf and yeah um, I really really love this guy's work um, so other than this you know he has done holy crap 169 completed I'm not gonna go over every single one I promise let's see so so yeah some of the more prominent that I really wanted to underline you know yeah yeah he did also do the music for the sixth Mission Impossible movie let's see he did yeah I have I haven't watched the Lego Batman movie I know I know but I hear the music is great and he was responsible for that uh, let's see some Kung Fu Panda stuff uh, let's see. Um, hmm. Oh, that's right. And he's also done some done some video games, including Assassin's Creed Three, where, yeah, he did amazing work on that one. Also, Assassin's Creed Revelations. Yeah. Just you know, unbelievably talented guy and yeah does a fantastic job here like I really you know this is one of those things where like I would own the soundtrack for this now uh, right so the the Mission Impossible movies have always tried to not get like too like you know, the, some of the Bond movies with their gadgets get really ridiculous. Uh, you know, the Mission Impossible movies, they don't try to be quite as, like, restrained as, like, the Bourne movies. But it's still not. They're not going absolutely crazy. This one pushes some things a little further, but a lot of it is still very much like just, yeah, you know, what we have in the real world. Now, the movie is 2 hours and 35 minutes long without end credits, and there's no reason to stay through the end credits, as already mentioned. And, yeah, you know, if you're watching it by yourself, if you're not going to upset anyone by walking out, I guess maybe give it 35 minutes. If at that point you just do not care about seeing what happens after that, yeah, you might, I, I guess it's, you know, you might as well. Stop watching. So the best element here is more of Macquarie's vision for Mission Impossible. 
the worst aspect, in my opinion, to to me, is the there's just too little diversity and the focus. You know, even when th there are there is some diversity in in casting, but a lot of the focus are on white men. You know, which just like come on, can we can we please move move beyond? I'm a white dude, and I'm calling for like just you know I've been I've been s seeing my own face in so much media since I was a child and you know the fact that there are people who look like me who are crying about oh now not every single media major character is white anymore or not always male just makes me so embarrassed with my kin and yeah, just like we gotta, we gotta do better. You know, put put more diversity in media, in front of and behind the camera. Now, yeah, so so um, something I saw others say what they thought was the worst thing was about the movie was that it was less than what it could be because of the pandemic. The thing I was most worried about was that it would be frustrating that it's only part one, but no, it absolutely exceeded my expectations. I left with a huge grin on my face. And, yeah, the thing I was most looking forward to was the stunts, and the movie absolutely exceeded my expectations. I've, I've seen some people say, oh, you know, they put the best stuff in the trailer. What trailer were, were you watching? A lot of the best stuff is absolutely not in the trailers. Now, I, I will say, you know, one thing, some of the stunt, st you know, that's the thing. Like, if you're going to add, you know, jokes to, to a Mission Impossible movie, it's going to have to involve the stunts. You know, it, it doesn't, like, it doesn't get, like, Jackie Chan or, or you know, definitely not, like, Charlie Chaplin with it. But, yeah, there are a couple of times where there'll be a big stunt and, you know, it would, like, it, I, I would love it if the movie would just let us be like, oh, wow, you know, but instead they feel they, they have to put in a, a joke, and, yeah, it's it's too bad. I mean, I will say, like, the cast is game. Every every person in the cast, like, goes for the jokes. No one, I, I didn't get the vibe off anyone that they were like, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know, kind of thing, so... Anyway, um, yeah, the trailers definitely do give too much away, but also give you a good idea of what the movie's like. If you like the trailers, you're more likely to like the movie than if you do not. Now, the, let's, all oh, right, the cover and poster. I am very quickly going to, no, no. Um, cover and poster do not give too much away, and they're pretty cool. You know, worth looking up. Now, the. That brings us to. The Rotten Tomato score, which, holy crap. I knew it was high, but I, I wasn't quite sure it was still going to be. Yeah, it's, it's 96%. It's certified fresh. It has 311 reviews. Only 12 of them are rotten. I kind of want to see what even are the rotten. Right, let's see. Okay, so this person thinks that the chase sequences are too long, and unlike the film, is overall too long. Um, let's see. One guy says it wasn't that suspenseful, and too. Right, this guy. One one guy says, "Oh, it was like an AI wrote." the script and yeah one guy says it's not quite let's see other than the stunt work it's not quite as good as its most high high profile competitor which I'm guessing is Bond um Oh, hmm. Okay, this guy kind of has a point. Um, but yeah, this guy says the he has a different point. 
but something he says he he doesn't feel that Cruz does that well as as an actor he does as a stuntman um yeah this per one one person says it's you know just a product it's predictable and yeah one guy says the dialogue is really bad um yeah well, okay this is actually true the one one guy says that the you know the writers struggle to balance a lot of the the characters here yeah one one per one critic says uh, you know one one rotten critic says oh it's you know part one that's frustrating um another say the plot doesn't make up for it another says it ends up coming out like a half-baked Christopher Nolan brain fart another said it feels like uh, it was assembled by a luckless studio intern who was handed a bucket of half-complete rushes and told to go make a COVID beating blockbuster out of that there's some truth to that Anyway, but yeah, um, the the there's more than 1,000 verified ratings. The audience score is 94 percent. The average rating is 4.7 out of five. The average critic rating is 8.0 out of 10. Consensus with world-threatening stakes and epic set pieces to match that massive title, Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One proves this is still a franchise you should choose to accept. And that brings us to Metacritic. Which is just as eager as ever to throw lots of Mission Impossible at me that I couldn't possibly be looking. Who still look who in the who in the year 2023 is looking up a 2003 PS2 game? That it's, even if it is a Mission Impossible one. Anyway, here we go. Yes, it has an 81 out of 100, based on 62 critics, 60 positive, two mixed. Let's see the two, the mixed ones. Let's see. Yeah, one says you know by the. By the time of the ending, most people will stop caring because their heads hurt. This guy still gave it 6 out of 10. Um, and... Yeah, the other one, does, this doesn't even really sound like a mixed review. I guess he's saying the, the only thing the movie does well is action, but really the quote is just about how good the action is. Anyway, um, and the users... Yeah, the user score is 8.6 out of 10, based on 52 ratings, 47 positive, 2 mixed, 3 negative, and... Wow, one person gave it a 0 out of 10, saying it's the worst since the original. The worst since the original. I mean, that tells me right there that I really am not interested in, in hearing your take on like if you think the first one was bad holy crap um yeah one gave one guy gave it a four out of ten and said it feels like the plot to a bad superhero movie or the plot to a spin-off film hmm i guess i can kind of see what he means by that and that brings us to imdb where it has an 8.2 out of 10 based on 29,000 ratings. 29.2% gave it 8. 25.3 gave it 10. 24.6 gave it 9. 13.8 gave it 7. There's not a lot that gave it lower than 7, which right there really tells you people really love this movie. 4% gave it 6. 1.4 gave it 5. 
0 0.8 gave it 1, 0 0.5 gave it 4, 0 0.3 gave it 3, 0 0.2 gave it 2. And there are right now 404 IMDb user reviews. If you hide the spoilers, you are down to 308. And let's see. Yeah, and I, I read the, the uh, let's see, the I read 100 of them. And right, so yeah, I've already talked some about the the stunts, but I do want to, yeah, you know, there's like jumping from from something tall and and like, you know, yeah, maneuvering in in the air. There's fights where like some of the moves you're like, okay, how is how is that person still okay? How can how can they still like? Can we, can we cut cameras? I think someone forgot they were shooting a movie and accidentally hurt a stunt person. You know, so, yeah. The, just, yeah. It, it's, the, the stunts so frequently look like the person being filmed is actually in danger, which is one of those things where, like, we're sitting there hoping, oh, God, please don't, you know, don't actually put someone in danger. Because, you know, we all know that capitalism, well, maybe not to a rich actor, but other than that, like, there's a lot of people that capitalism would happily sacrifice if it earned them even a tiny bit more, if it earned the capitalist the, the, at, at the top a tiny bit more money. But anyway, you know, there's that. And, and on the other hand, it's like, holy crap, you know, are they, you know, because, like, we know, we, we're watching it, we know that it's fake, but it's still, like, really, really cool to see. And, yeah, it's not a hugely violent movie, but it knows when to go for, like, a really messed up kind of attack on someone. Yeah, um, I think ultimately comes down to, to eight, you know, incredible action spy flicks out of ten. And, yeah, um, I've, it's, it's extremely rare that I watch something more than once in a movie theater. This is not gonna break that trend, but, like, yeah, it's 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 the kind of thing. Like, if it wasn't so long, I I might seriously consider that. But yeah, um, the yeah. So the the ranking of all seven Mission Impossible movies, worst to best. Keeping in mind, I love all of them, from the bottom to the top. Two, three, four, seven, one, five, and six. It just it it isn't completely as solid as yeah one five and six, but it's definitely it's much better than than four and three and two. Um yeah, that is it for the review itself. So from here on out, spoilers. So. You have been warned, and a lot of what I'm going to say isn't even going to make sense if you haven't watched the movie already. Um, there we go. So, starting with the first spoiler section, notes taken while watching. I actually managed to fill out the entire, like, every, every single page of this, of this pad. It's been quite some time since that happened. So yeah, very very cool opening, you know, with the with the submarine and it's like, I mean, we already knew that like, Macquarie and Cruz have taste in film, but even so, like, Hunt for Red October, uh, holy crap, like like just, yeah. Love, love to see it. Love to see a, a love letter to this kind of just yeah. And the and and it's the kind of thing where like you know I don't 
I'm not sure I see Tom Cruise making a movie that's like hugely like that from start to finish. You know, you could do that back was that from like 1990 or something. You you know, you could do that back then, but today I I don't think it would be someone like Cruise at least. And uh, yeah, you know, this this thing of, uh, you know, the the key like keeps them undetected and and the the stealth thing and we you know we immediately get the the thing with you know okay so you have the keys and you know if you the the you know they can be split they can be t stuck together and you you get how it's you know and the thing of you know he can see us and like holy crap like you know that's gotta be like the scariest thing if you're in a submarine is for someone else to be aware of you. You know, I've never served on a submarine, but I don't mean to brag here. I have played all four official thief games, so you know, I have a little bit of experience. Seriously though, you know, that was when they were developing the first one. They were thinking like, well, it's like a submarine. You know, you're dangerous if you're hidden. You're exposed, you know, it, yeah, you're very exposed if they know where you are. And, yeah, this did a really great job with that kind of, yeah. And, yeah, the 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 entity, right, I did also, I, th I guess, yeah, I ended up not copying it in. But someone pointed out, you know, it's ridiculous how many times in this movie characters say the entity, you know. And it is, like, a... It would maybe have been okay if the entity had more than one name, although I guess, I, I get that that would also be like, well, you know, in, in the spy community, the less you know about a thing, the the better, so, or the, the less information there is to be able to share, but yeah. But yeah, the thing actually, you know, the, it, the entity tricks them into firing their torpedoes, at some at a submarine that isn't there and then it you know uses that torpedo to blow them up even though it is on the submarine you know so that right there tells us like holy crap this thing does not screw around and you know later in the film when we see you know things that appear to not be there on on monitors and such like we get what's what's going on let's see and yeah you know we have the thing oh it's blown through the countermeasures and just yeah and Yeah, and then we get the, the, you know, after the, the submarine is destroyed, we, you know, we go to, to young guy, you know, f food delivery, you know, and, and Ethan is there, the, <gasps> is like, just, just calm down, you know, clearly a, a rookie, and, oh, okay, so, no, 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 designated, remember, oh, oh, right, 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 you know, and just, yeah. And the thing with the, was it the, the oath, you know, and this thing, of, you know, 30 years ago, Ethan chose IMF over some, some punishment or something, you know, and the, the, yeah, we see him witness Gabriel kill someone. And I, I really appreciate that, you know, I mentioned in the review that, you know, he's this really sadistic you know, just the description that it wasn't the death that Gabriel, it wasn't killing that he enjoyed, it was the pain that that would inflict. And it's like, holy crap, just, you know, you gotta stop this guy. This is just a monster, you know. And, yeah, we, we learn, you know, America put 50 million bounty on Ilsa and the bounty hunters, what was it, you know, they never bring anyone back alive, and they rarely bring them back in one piece, and again, it's like, 
You don't have to tell me another word. I want Ethan to demolish them. And let's see. You know, and and you know, yeah. When when we get to like, it is very clear. Like, okay, these bounty hunters mean business. They definitely, they really want to just take out you know, the the Rebecca Ferguson character under any and all circumstances, so, I don't know, maybe they watched Men in Black International, and, yeah, it was, it was cool that, you know, the camera pans from the, and, and then we see Tom Cruise there on a horse lying down, you know, and, like, I don't know very much about horses, but in case someone else, someone is watching who is not aware of the following, Horses can, at least temporarily, lie down like that. They they weren't hurting the horse. The the you know, it, yeah, it's it's you know it's something that we might think of. Okay, that can't possibly be safe, but there is some you know under the right circumstances they they can. And certainly you see it. You know, you see the horse rise up and then move. It would not be able to do that if it got hurt from the way it was, you know. But yeah, I'm I'm not sure I've seen a horse hide like that before. Let's see. Yeah, and and we see Ilsa is, you know, in this sniper position, and Ethan signals to her, but then he's spotted by the bounty hunters, and yeah, very cool action scene. You know, great use of the dust cloud. And let's see. So, so yeah, we learn, you know, Gabriel killed, you know, someone to hurt Ethan. You know, we're starting on the two-part finale. So we're learning things about Ethan that we never knew before. You know, and and I could I could see you know the idea that he was a vigilante for well, maybe vigilante is not quite the term, but you know he he sought out vigilante justice for the woman that Gabriel killed. Let's see, or did Gabriel make people think that Ethan killed anyway? And, yeah, I, I appreciate that, you know, the government were okay when the entity were just, you know, spreading lies on social media. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard anybody accuse this series of being subtle. So, there's that. Like, holy crap. Shots fired. And they were using the sniper for those shots as well. That was that was a bullseye. Holy crap. Get off the soapbox. And the let's see. Um Yeah, we, we get the you know, the, yeah, they talk about, you know, now it's targeting the world intelligence and the, the idea of truth online. And, you know, the, the, the enemy has no center. Not a moral one, not a nougat one. And, yeah, I will definitely say when, when they were taught that I don't necessarily think it was necessary to spend... Like, if I had to guess, it's maybe four or five minutes of just talking in the in the office there. And it's like, I, I get it. I realize that it's, you know, they feel this is extremely necessary. You know, they obviously the scene, it would not be there in a movie that's already this long. It, like, it would be one thing if the movie was just barely reaching, like, 90 minutes. And then, like, at one point you have, like, five minutes of just nonstop talking. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, they, um... They were worried that it was going to get rejected. It's like, oh, it's less than 90 minutes. You know, just, but no, like clearly, you know, Macquarie 
and Jenderson legitimately felt that it was necessary to really hammer home these these points and that is you know that is the thing you do if you're if you're if your movie involves something so complicated then yeah now let's see the um yeah and and we you know they talk about the the IMF and um you know this thing of oh you know most people don't even know that the IMF exists and I mean, I, I get, like, if this is, you know, the last hurrah, and they're also doing the thing with, let's add some MCU jokes. So we have the thing about, you know, so you don't know who he is, and he can turn down the mission. And it's like, okay, we get it. You, you can move on. It's, this is not necessary. And, yeah, you know, we see the, the gas grenade that affects... Everyone other than than Kittredge and Ethan, you know, I I gotta say I did not think, you know, I I thought oh this is like this guy's working for for Gabriel or something, but nope, it turns out to be Ethan. Let's see, and yeah, we you know, Ilsa, you know, is is hiding the, you know. Ethan helped her fake her death. And and yeah, I, I mean, I will definitely say the 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 editing of the desert scene. You know, you can tell that they had to to cut some corners. You know, they had they were able to shoot a lot of it. Maybe a bunch of it was even finished when then you know lockdown kind of stuff came up and they had to you know abide by those rules and i do also want to say like it is great that they did uh, you know i forget was um the i i remember hearing about cruz ranting like that was actually um Let's see. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, he was, you know, and that's obvious. You know, don't the the, and he did. Yeah, he did end up apologizing and saying, you know, right message, wrong delivery, and you know, yeah, the the, you know, he's he got angry at them for breaking the protocols. You know, saying we are not shutting shutting this effing movie down, which led um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um, one of the one of the late night hosts, Stephen Colbert, to to say you know the you know the new movie Mission Impossible Seven feet or you're effing gone, you know. Yeah, that was that was funny. You know, he wasn't saying who cares about COVID. He was saying we want this movie to happen. You have to take these protocols seriously so that we are not forced to shut this down, kind of thing. You know, so like he shouldn't have shouted at them, and the fact that he apologized is good, but he shouldn't have done it in the first place. But at least it was for that. It wasn't, you know. So so yeah. Let's see, right, and and Ethan is gonna, you know, leave there, and he gets out by posing as as Kittredge, and uh, you know, Kittredge, like, of course. And I gotta say, like the the speech that he says in this scene, like they used parts of that in the trailer, and it was like it looked like the big villain speech, like the big thing of like you're never gonna say, you know, like the villain telling the hero. You will never defeat me, and here's why. You know, but but no, it's it's like I you know before seeing him on the train late in the movie, I was like, okay, I guess they fooled us. I I thought Kittredge was gonna be a bad guy. You know, he does turn out to be near the end, but for a while, you know, not 
there and yeah the the um, um let's see yeah and we see the the um hmm. yeah the, there's you know just des describing ethan right and you have the the you have the AR overlay, which I thought was a, a great way to, to get in there. Yeah. And you have the thing, with, you know, well, there's a very sus bag over there. And, okay, I guess we got to, we got to, you know, right. And, and the, you know, right after it's, it's seen, it blips out. And, like, Benji is like, oh, I guess it was a glitch in the, pro, in the software or something. But we, the attentive viewer, are like, ha ha. I see where this is going. The the entity is you know is doing it again. And let's see. Yeah, and and we you know I love the you know um, Ethan's to you know both yeah both Luther and Benji messing with the facial recognition to trick. Um, I'll have it. Or maybe I won't. Uh, Shea Wiggum. Suddenly I'm not. Fine. Oh, there it is. Yeah, Briggs. You know, tricking him into going after the, you know, people who aren't actually Ethan and, and you know, first one end and the other end. And then he figures out, okay, there's something going, you know, and they send them out to, to check individually, which, you know, it's a, it's a great escalation because you think, oh no, are they already going to get caught? Oh, okay, it wasn't, you know, so they, they, Get it? They they release some tension and get it slightly, you know, to a new baseline. But then, oh no, they're gonna search, you know. So it spikes against great stuff. And I I do sometimes I'm immature. I would be lying if I said that I didn't laugh every single time that Briggs goes up and he's like, I know this guy's hunt. So you know, okay, the face looks wrong. Um, okay, fine, it's not a mask, you know, just, like, yeah, yeah, I, that is, that is what someone would do if they felt convinced that they were in front of the right person, but they thought they were wearing that mask, that's, so, so, yeah, and, yeah, we have the, some pickpocketing, and yeah, we we see, you know it may the the bag may be a bomb, and let's see. Um, yeah, and I I like the, you know when when Ethan has you know both keys. And he does the the sleight of hand thing that he also did in the first movie, and we also, you know, at the end of the movie, we have not Max herself, but a descendant of Max sitting in a train car, you know, making a deal with Kittredge, and and there's a there's some there's a there's a progress bar that has to reach a certain level, you know, there's uh, yeah. And and this time it's not that the signal is being jammed or blocked, it's that that's not actually the the max relative. Now, and I did like this thing of you know she keeps leaving the um, Grace keeps leaving the um, lighter cigarette lighter instead of you know so yeah so that he thinks that he hasn't just been been pickpocketed and yeah turns out there's a five minute countdown on the bomb and it's apparently a nuke and it's like i need what am i gonna do without tools oh i have you know and grabs a bag off the thing and yeah there's apparently 1.5 billion was this the part where it was in crypto, which again, you know, very, very relevant. And let's see. 
you are done. Not yet, we're not, no, I, it says done with, you know, D-U-N-N, it knows who I am. And, let's see. Um, yeah, and, and the thing with, you know, the, the display and, you know, it'll, it'll ask them to solve riddles, which, like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm down for this version of the Riddler, honestly. And I like that Grace solves the, the riddle, the thing with, you know, what was it? It's always coming, but it never arrives tomorrow. And yeah, and we see that, you know, the guy who had the key is now dead. Sorry to bother you, but we're dealing with a nuke. And, you know, turns out it wasn't a, a bomb. And, you know, it, all, it also, it's great this thing of, you know, what is the, what, what, what was the word again? Um, right, and, and Grace took the key. But, but yeah, you have the thing with, you know, it's just, it's trying to get to know more about Benji. You know, what it, what are you most afraid of? And, yeah, like, an algorithm, you know, that's, like, it, it wants to know who you are, and then it uses that, you know, I mean, real-life algorithms are not quite as evil as, as this one, but they do use you, they do use algorithms and the information they have about you, to try, or, or, you know, you, us, they try to control us. They try to control what we see, you know, so it's, yeah, it's very relevant. Uh, I quite appreciate it. And then we have the, um, you know, and, and it's like asking, like asking riddles and such, like, you know, I mean, chat GPT gets smarter when we, write questions to it, so I guess that's what that is. Let's see, that brings us... Yeah, and we see, you know, when when Ethan sees Gabriel, you know, he aborts the mission and says, we're not meeting anywhere. And... Tom Cruise runs. And I do appreciate the this thing of, like... You know, we've seen it so many times, so let's do a joke with it, you know, where we're like, Briggs is like, I know, Ethan Hunt has to be somewhere around here, I just don't know where he is, and, you know, he's running behind, in, in the background, and it's like, it's the most obvious joke, it's, it's a very, like, it's, it's like baby's first real joke kind of thing, but it was kind of funny, I laughed. And, yeah, so, so Grace has been arrested, and we learn, you know, all over the world she's been arrested for, for various crimes. And, you know, the, the, um, yeah, she's, you know, she's playing innocent. So she's like, I'm sorry, can, can I just see one of these passports? You know, and she checks it and slides the, the paper clip, you know, a nice sleight of hand and, you know, into her hand. And, and she pretends she doesn't know anything about, the, you know, obviously she's going to use the, the paper clip to, to pick handcuffs. You know, we've seen that before. But where they go with it in this movie, you know, not something I remember seeing before. So that's... Very cool, as you know, her lawyers here. My my what? You know, and uh, yeah, of course. So, yeah, and and um, Gabriel knows everything about the the guy that arrested um, arrested the um. Holy crap. Arrested Grace, that's it. And, you know, he said, it wouldn't be the first time you stole, you know, the, 
and yeah, he wants the key from him. And the the I I hope that in the next movie we'll learn more about. Did we even were we even told like apparently her name is Marie, the character played by Mariella Garriga, who you know she gets shot in the. Uh, what's it called in the um, in the flashbacks? You know, it's I. Yeah, not a not a fan of a woman existing just to. In in a piece of fiction, you know, existing and being killed just to motivate the the pain of a male character. So I'm hoping that they do much more with her in the next one. Uh, you know fleshing her out in, in flashbacks or something. And, you know, clever that Grace put the key with an, an unwitting courier. Just, yeah, really, really clever. And, yeah, we get Grace's backstory with, you know, she was an orphan, she wanted riches, so she was trained. Let's see. And... Um, right, and there's the thing about, you know, almost all of the contact was electronic, and yeah, you know, so it was the entity. And yeah, so um, in order to get away from Ethan, Grace, you know, accuses him of sexual assault, which just like that's gross don't make light of such a serious subject like there's so many things that you could have done there that just yeah now yeah uh really really cool as they're driving around in dri yeah driving around venice in in the various vehicles really loved the like reaction shots of paris when she's like you know Sometimes she's like, yes, I was able to ram the car into that person. And sometimes she'd be like trying to run someone over. Ah, crap, I can't believe I missed the girl, you know. Just, yeah. And let's see the, um, what on earth does that say? Drive. Arrest. Oh right, they, yeah, they attempt to to arrest and the just yeah, and and I like I like that the safe car is the tiny yellow one and Ethan is really struggling with the controls of it and um yeah and the the. You know they they swap places, and the this thing of you know them being handcuffed together because you know I mean yeah there's not a lot of trust there so just, yeah, and um, let's see yeah and the the you know get, getting really close to the the train tracks and. Getting out just in time, and you know, Grace, like she could have left him to die, but she does throw him the paperclip, and you know he gets out just in time. And it's this thing, you know, I've I've seen movies, I've seen movies before, so of course I've seen someone, you know, using using a paperclip to pick the handcuffs. Never seen it while you know a train is headed for the car that they're locked in. So, you know that was very intense, very very cool. And yeah, Ethan meets back up with the team, including Ilsa. And yeah, you know, apparently, you know, maybe the White Widow still thinks that Ethan is actually John Lark. And you know, the the there was the thing about the money, and then you know. Ilsa says, oh, you know, they figured something out. They never said what it was. And Ethan is like, can we move on? And I'm like, I guess 
that the idea is supposed to be that they slept together and Ethan is embarrassed, so that's another kind of gross sex. Like, I'm not saying it would be way better if, like, you know, she said, oh, they figured something out, and he was like, yeah, we did, high thought, or, you know, that wouldn't have been, but just, like, yeah, it, it didn't have to, didn't have to be that, you know, I appreciate that it's, it almost definitely went over the heads of younger members of the, like, if, if you brought someone who was too young that you would not want them to know that casual sex is a thing, they probably didn't realize from from watching this and let's see the right and the yeah they say that Gabriel was the only person who um, who did not get identified in the airport you know he was erased in real time and it was like you know the moment that like Ethan saw him and, like, took off the glasses and then he's just gone. Like, at first I was like, okay, are we really going, like, deep into, like, this kind of sci-fi, you know, but no. Later on it is explained. Like, basically, when Ethan is seeing him there in the, in the AR glasses, he's not there. He's just... The, the idea is for, for Ethan to think that that's actually... Gabriel and you know I mean what if he like goes to try to attack him or something you know that's gonna slow him down and give Gabe the actual Gabriel who is you know in the vicinity but he's not right there that's gonna give him time to escape you know similar to how they were scrambling it was basically like both teams were getting played by someone else with technical know-how you know uh, uh, Luther and Benji were making uh, Briggs think that the Briggs and Degas, or is it Dega, um, who seemed very, very precious, just like, I mean, I'm kind of on everybody's side, and it's like, that's that's kind of adorable. Like, I, I really like this guy. That's that's very sweet, and like, honestly, I mean, yeah, we should all be like, if if everyone is going to lose out on the, like, it's, yeah, I, I like him. I hope he gets more character stuff in the next one. Um, also, the, the the actor's middle name is Tarzan, and that's just so freaking cool. Oh, he was also in Top Gun Maverick. I'm guessing that was probably, you know, Tom Cruise likes to work. When, when he finds someone that he really gets along with, he likes to work with them, you know, multiple times. Um, wait, is he not going to be in the... Okay, this kind of uh, looks like he isn't. Or maybe just hasn't been confirmed for part two. I mean, he didn't die in this one, did he? Holy crap, did I... I, I don't know, maybe... And anyway. Um... Oh, he he was in a short called The White Shoes with Sasha Kale, who did who who played. Um, I feel like that is such a to me. Why is why is it Superman and then Super Girl instead of Superwoman? But but yeah, uh, Kara L. You know she played Kara L in The Flash. It was one of the few really good parts about that movie. So. That's kind of cool. Anyway, um, the the anyway, I'd like to see him in, in more stuff. Is is what I'm saying. Uh, that brings us to right, and yeah, Ilsa knows Gabriel, and you know, I think it's her who says, you know. Death is a gift that he means to share with the world. Wow. That's, yeah. And, you know, it's that thing, you know, oh, you know, Ilsa's helping the the people at MI6 who can't directly, you know, fight to, to stop 
the entity, uh, you know, and then, you know, we get the detail, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, of course they, they communicated electronically, <gasps> you know, it's, it's that thing, it's just great stuff, you know, because, like, for the audience and the character, the other characters, immediately it's like, that's the thing, that's, that was the thing, the, you know, so, yeah, very, very cool that that's the, let's see, and then we have, and, you know, that is, like, that is a, it is an actual problem in the real world, that we sometimes, we don't know who, you know, who is trying to, to communicate with us, like, we you kind of just have to accept that it's, that it actually is the, the name that it says, uh, Let's see, and, yeah, you know, we get the thing about, you know, Ilsa and Ethan and the team, and, you know, they know the risks, and, yeah, and they go to the, the party, and Gabriel tells Grace that he knows who she is. You know, she's trying to be like, you know, no, it's, it's not you that I'm waiting for. And he's like, eh, that's... See, that is is how you, you do that kind of, you know, he approaches her and she's like, leave, please, leave me alone. And he's pushing because he's the bad guy. He's being creepy. You know, he's he's handsome. He's, he's you know... But he's being very creepy and very, very, uh, you know, it's it's very uncomfortable watching, and we want him to stop. You know, that's how you work that kind of thing in. Uh, you know, as long as it doesn't like, I I would be against it. Uh, I'd be against it if it if they pushed it to like touch also or something. But just yeah, and uh, um. Gabriel tells Grace, uh, right, right, that's when we get, yeah, about Maria. And we learn that Alana handpicked Grace. I want all, I, I want everyone to get along, with me especially, just, yeah. That's a great, you know, and that that's that's such a great like that's Max in a nutshell. You know, as long as she can benefit from this, you know, let's let's all be friends. As as long as I'm getting something out of it, kind of thing. And yeah, you know, they discuss about the key, and then the the entity takes over the screens. It's very very creepy. Gabriel threatens Grace and Ilsa, and I do quite like, you know, that is written. And, yeah, so, so yeah, Grace manages to get back the key, and it, it was kind of funny when, like, you know, the, the other guys, like, what the f and then like just as he's starting to say the naughty word it's, you know Ethan tackles him and it's like you know okay yeah cuz cuz they can't get away with saying you know so so he's he's watching his language Ethan is watching the other guy's language and that's uh, you know i i kind of I'm torn. A part of me wants to see something like that happen in the MCU when, you know, yeah, once Deadpool joins. But on the other hand, I kind of want him to be able to swear freely as we're used to seeing him. And then the, let's see. Um... Hmm. Oh right, right. Yeah, the, uh, Luther is trying to do the deal with the satellites, but the entity keeps getting to them before he can, and it hacks and uses Benji's voice to lure Ethan and 
you know, the real Benji can't do anything, and, you know, I mentioned in the review, like, his voice is a tad more grizzled now, you know, it kind of reminded me of, of Dewey in Scream 5, like, it's, you know, we've been used to this character being kind of comic relief, you know, not quite as serious, even when there's serious stuff all around him in these other movies, but, yeah, the fact, you know, when he gets, like, really creepy, He's like, you know, you're what was it? You're not Benji. No, I'm not. But you are done. You know, that was legitimate. And, and I'm not sure, like, if, like, I guess, it's, no, I'm not sure it would have been as convincing if, like, the Simon Pegg of the the spaced days would have tried to deliver a line like that in in the sinister manner and let's see right and Ethan versus Paris and we have the thing with the the blades let's see. yeah and and grace you know takes a uh, switchblade to attack Gabriel I think is the time. yeah and and we have the the fight where Ilsa has a sword, Gabriel has a switchblade, and yeah, um, so basically the editing and the music are, you know, telling me, oh, you know, it's really, like, there's no way that uh, Ilsa will survive her confrontation with Gabriel if Ethan doesn't get there in time when it's like, I mean, she's a spy like him. She has incredible training as well. I just, yeah, really, really not a fan. Like, a, if they're gonna do a bit like that, at least have it be a female character who isn't a spy. Have it be someone who can't defend herself or something, but don't make it just, yeah. And, yeah, um, Gabriel does indeed kill... Ilsa, and I mean, I guess maybe they don't think that they have more interesting things to do with her in these movies, and certainly I can appreciate the idea of, of closure, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, like, I'm not saying that no female character in fiction should ever, ever be killed, I just don't think that it's that meaningful. I think it would have been meaningful if when she died, if, if she, you know, was in a fight with Gabriel and she manages to do something that will win the day and like, yeah, right after she dies, you know, but she was imperative to, to saving things, you know, I, I think that would have been the way to go with, with that, you know, killing her to motivate Ethan's man pain just... Yeah, I really, really don't like... Like, how many... So, so in this movie, we get one flashback frid fridging and one present-day fridging. Just, yeah, I, I don't... I actually, like, I don't want Grace to die either, but at least her death, it would be like, well, I mean, she's fighting a spy. At least... Yeah, I'm, I'm not actually 100% sure if Gabriel is... A spy, but the fact that Ilsa died, even though she started the fight with a sword, and all he had at the start of the fight was a switchblade, like that just seems ridiculous. Let's see. This movie kind of had an anti-switchblade thing going on, didn't it? Uh, I can, I can. That's that's acceptable. That um, agreeable. It's. You know, kids shouldn't have switchblades, so that's, yeah. Because, like, seriously, almost every time someone, like, okay, so, um, Ilsa dies, and it's sad. She stabbed with a switchblade. Uh, you know, Paris dies, and it's actually, like, oh, I mean, she redeemed herself right at the end. It's a switchblade. I mean, I, I suppose I wouldn't say that it was sad when Denlinger died, like, I thought I could trust Carrie Elwes. I bet he not. Dude probably doesn't even do the claw properly. Ugh, just, you know. 
At least he can do a proper British accent, which not every Robin Hood can. But the just yeah, you know, it was it was dramatic when he when he died. Yeah, and we get the, the you know Grace has few options. You know, d d she can go to jail, she can die, or she can cho make the choice. You know, join IMF, and yeah, that was legitimately. It's it's kind of cool that here at the very end we see the proper recruitment of because like you know Hannah in the second movie, Naya, holy crap. I've had a lot of sugar in my defense. I'm I'm crashing. Naya in the second movie wasn't really she wasn't like planning to become a permanent spy. She was going to do one mission. This is Grace choosing to be IMF. You know, you know, I yeah, IMF uh, until death, I guess. And yeah, like um they do the they do a like a one shot. She gets the, the mask and you know puts it on and walks up to the mirror and looks in it and and like adjusts. Did they? Because the camera was always showing the back of her head, so that must have been Haley Atwell putting on. And then walking. Out. Did they do the thing with like a face? It's not really a mirror. It's actually a window, and like they just rehearsed making the same moves at the same time so that they. Could, it's very cool because it. That's almost definitely Vanessa Kirby looking back there. There at the end. So so just yeah, very very impressive. Let's see and yeah. You know, Luther points out, you know, have to go offline, find the entity, and lock down the... Yeah. And, and yeah, it's... You know, the fact that Luther doesn't at all participate more here at the end does feel like, oh, I mean, they... It was a thing with, like... Or maybe also just that they they had so many characters... Even as they're killing off several of them, they don't have enough. Yeah. Um, I guess I could very briefly... I mentioned that I felt that there were probably at least two characters too many. I... There's not really anything Zola does that Alana couldn't do without him. So, so that, yeah, that accounts for one of them. I mean, Briggs and Dega don't really, like, it's just that you could just have the character of Briggs just thinking out loud instead. And I do also think, like, basically, Paris and Gabriel, like, yeah, just, you know, com combine them. Just, although, I don't really want to lose Palm Clement TF. It's, but but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, like if I'm if I'm gonna completely what's the saying, kill my darlings, you know. Yeah, there there didn't really need to be two separate characters there, like. I'm not like like I've already said I don't you know the second movie definitely has issues, but. I don't think that you should combine, the characters. Of the uh, okay, my my brain definitely can't uh, click the wrong one. Um, okay, here we go. I'm you know I don't think it would make sense to combine Du Gray Scott's Sean Ambrose and Richard Roxburgh's Hugh Stamp because they go against each other on multiple occasions, and it's actually part of the the tension. And near the end of the movie, wait, really? Dominic Purcell is in Ulrich. I don't remember an Ulrich. I mean, maybe he wasn't bald. That's any anyway. Yeah, he he had small roles like that back then. He was he also had a small role in Equilibrium. 
you know. Anyway, yeah, the the um, there's there's some tension between Sean and Hugh, and at the end, you know, specifically Ethan poses as Hugh. Now, let, right, and we get the detail that the entity wins if Ethan kills Gabriel. And there's no mask for... Ethan, no mask for you. So he has to get on the train while it's in motion, which, you know, yeah, wouldn't have it any other way. That's... And, yeah, he's going to have to jump onto a moving train... For, you know, on on a on a motorcycle and with the the what's it called like para paraglider or something like that. Just let's see, and and Gabriel makes so that the train is almost impossible to stop. And Ethan wasn't able to get on just yet. Just yeah, and. Let's see, then we have the, yeah, we learned that apparently Kittrich is the buyer. You're not Alana, and, and Grace is like, um, and then, you know, because Alana is just this tall, you know, just, <laughs> that was, that was a, a great, yeah. And, yeah, we learn, you know, the deal that, Kittrich made at the end of Mission Impossible Th One with Max was the the you know that it would as long as it was in self interest uh, just, yeah uh, yeah and I really appreciate your know, Grace is not good at this whole spy thing because she's she's a thief you know and it's this thing of like well if Ethan was there next to her looking like Gabriel. You know, he could help a lot. That was what she was anticipating. And then with like one hour before the train leaves, suddenly she learns she has to go on her own. That's not enough time for them to, to change. Just, yeah. And yeah, we learned that uh, Denlinger has some knowledge, but Gab Gabriel kills him. I guess he got the enough knowledge from him. And the, let's see, yeah, and, and Grace does regret helping Kittredge and doesn't take the money and the thing, you know, I'd be selling my soul in so many words. And, uh, let's see, yeah, so, you know, it's big theme here is if Ethan can protect the people he cares about. And, yeah, you know, the real Alana is slowly waking up, and, yeah, and Grace pick, picks pocket, pickpockets the key, and, let's see, hmm. <clears throat> Right, and the, the, yeah, Zola demands the key, and Ethan goes through the wall of the train and managed to, to save, and Gabriel and Ethan fight on top of the train, awesome, Grace has to stop the train, you know, despite how difficult that has been made, love the fight inside the tunnel, you know, it's this thing of, like, I saw, I think it was the abridged script that pointed out, you know, the scene in The Wolverine is even more ridiculous than the scene in The First Mission Impossible. I wouldn't say this is more ridiculous than the scene in The Wolverine, but, you know, overall, I definitely think it's better than that one. And, yeah, you know, Ethan wants to kill... Gabriel, even though he knows he needs him, and let's see. yeah, Grace is relieved that Ethan has the key, and Gabriel is, of course, furious that he didn't get it, and they have to 
jump like for between train cars and just yeah really really cool there's a falling piano which like I mean okay Looney Tunes I guess for a, for a little bit yeah and yeah and and Paris rescues Ethan and it gives the information about the submarine and yeah, Grace accepts the choice. We get the monologue by Kittredge, the briefing for the mission, and the camera goes to the submarine. So we, you know, the movie is bookended with the submarine, and the end credits start rolling. And that is it for that section. I, do I actually have very much in the final section? I um yeah I will go ahead there we go so the final section notes taken before watching and let's see um yeah so yeah um a betrayal and or a disavowal since literally the only let's see yeah, the first six movies, the second is the only one to not have a disavowal. And that one does have a betrayal. It, yeah, all of these have at least one betrayal. Yeah, I feel like they say at the start that they've technically already been disavowed. So yeah, I, I felt that as long as they could keep thinking of com complicated relationship situations for... Ilsa and Ethan, I hope they keep her around, uh, let's see, and, you know, yeah, noting, you know, she's now the longest lasting major character played by a woman in this franchise, no other woman has been a major part in three of these, most of them don't even get to appear in more than one at all. The second place is Michelle Monaghan as Julia, who had a major role in the third, supporting one in the sixth, uh, and a cameo in the fourth, but ultimately, yeah, like, they didn't really have anything particularly interesting here. They just, they made them a couple, and now, you know, like, them making them a couple was just so that her death would matter more, you know, and I just, yeah, really, really not a fan. That really did not work, I don't think. Um, you know, the, the thing that I really loved about her character in movies 5 and 6 was that there was that like in the fifth one she's you know they meet when she helps him escape she's one of the people you know she's apparently working for the people who caught him and yet she helps him escape and then make sure that she still has a cover you know and for the rest of the movie we're not quite sure can she tr can they can he trust her or not uh, you know and then in the Let's see, in the sixth one, it's that thing of, you know, she's been sent to kill the 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 guy that's a villain in, in both five and six, and Ethan has to keep him alive. So, you know, it's it's a great, you know, and then this one, there's not really a conflict there. Now, um, let's see, right, and, and some... Um, yeah, some critic quotes. The added distinguished feature of longer, if not time-wasting, humor and non-human main threat, in or in other words, it's getting closer to the sci-fi genre than the previous installment without diminishing the importance of human element. One thing I'd point out, though, is, that's just my personal subjective opinion, the take-home message about the dangers of the sentient AI that is imminent in the real world could have been stressed a little more. I doubt there will be many there will be people coming home from the theater thinking, bloody hell, what if something like this happens for real? It kind of stays within the realms of the film itself. The repercussions of creating such an AI will most likely not be felt by the audience that isn't particularly tech-savvy or doesn't keep up with current advances in the tech world. Maybe. Um, you know, I tr I'm, I've been trying to, to keep up with... You know, it's, it's moving very, very fast, scary fast, and, like, it's difficult to... to keep up but but yeah um i guess um i can i can see what the that 
reviewer is getting at. So uh, that's it for the the video. Let me know uh, what was what's your favorite Mission Impossible movie? What's your favorite spy movie in general? What's your favorite Tom Cruise stunt? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One or two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. It's suggested for you if you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie. Let's see. Um, yeah, and you know, I also do. Currently, it's one per week where I talk about an entire season of animated Star Wars. Uh, you know, but I will be completely up to date on those very soon and then you know there's not going to be one per week anymore I'm gonna do new ones as they get released I'm also doing a weekly episode on the most recently released episode of Secret Invasion the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of Scream Queens the most most recent episode or two that I've personally gotten around to watching of The Bear and you know, as soon as... Right, I already mentioned that. Um, recently, we've been thoughts videos to up very similar to this one. In other words, even more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back cards, which catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching the recording. And I will catch you next time, if you choose to... Yeah, I'm super crashing. Anyway, catch you next time.